All right, welcome everyone. We've got a big crowd today, ready for Kane to kill Abel. No one wanted to miss out on the fratricide. So let's go ahead and dig in. So we are in Genesis chapter four. We have just had the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And we are told now that these two first humans, Adam and Eve, are going to start conceiving. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of the passage. So supposedly these are the first children to Adam and Eve that we are told about. And one becomes a keeper of flocks, one tills the ground, but both attempt to offer the first fruits of their work to God. But for some reason, God regards Abel and Abel's offering, but not Cain and Cain's offering. What do you think is going on here? Yeah, Ben? An allegory for the conflict between pastoralists and agriculturalists. An allegory for the conflict between pastoralists and agriculturalists. Absolutely, why not? Yeah. Well, we could argue that later the priests wanted meat, and so the story would go that that would be a better option. Interesting. Okay, if we have a priest or writing, this kind of ties in to what Ben is saying in terms of perhaps there's an argument here for why pastoralists, which the Hebrew people were known mostly as shepherds and caretakers of flocks. And then the priests, if this is a priest writing it later, they want to privilege the animal sacrifice as the utmost sacrifice. There were stipulations for fruits and vegetables to be offered as well, herbs, etc. cetera. 10% um, of everything was supposed to be offered. Um, as kind of the tithe offering. And so, but there are levels of this and certainly the animal sacrifice is privileged. Yeah, great observations. Kevin? Um, does he swap, I, it doesn't say uh, that King brought the first. It doesn't, no. And it does say for Abel. And the other is it seems like a lot of this would have to do with like burnt attitude or something that she does in the world. Uh, mm. So, so it could be kind of perfunctory in one of them. Yeah. Um, Kevin says, important to note, it doesn't necessarily say that Cain is providing the first fruits of his offering. It does say that for Abel, but it doesn't say that for Cain. He provides an offering. 
And also, it seems as if something like this might be an orientation of the heart. Is one doing it in a, a perfunctory way or is one doing it out of devotion? Other observations? Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Um, Yeah, the idea about, then that will be part of Hebrew stipulations for sacrifices, is that you are supposed to get the very first of what you get from the land or from the flock, showing that you trust that more is to come by taking the first and offering that. You have more to say, Ben? Oh, yeah, just to go with, was it Bob? Oh, you were yeah. saying last week about um, psycho psychology um, and, you know, going through the myths in terms of psychology can also be based too, and this is to the rivalry, you go straight up competition for the affection of the parent, in this case, God. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of psychology, later psychologists will develop the term sibling rivalry, and here is the perfect place to read that. Chris. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We will definitely get to that important line. I don't know if any sacrifice had been given prior to this that Adam or Eve was supposed to have already done this or where they yeah. got the idea that they did it. So it's out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, Shirley saying, we don't know if other sacrifices have been offered to this point. So it seems as if it's happening out of nowhere. There hasn't been any stipulations that we've read about or instructions. So why are they doing it in the first place? Um, we've talked about over the course of the last couple of weeks, and Toby, you've pointed this out. We have two different avenues of interpretation here. So we understand that these first 11 chapters of Genesis are primeval history. They're intended to be mythology. They're intended to be folklore. And so we have the first tactic where we're kind of trying to puzzle out why it happened in a literal sense. And there is worth and value to those discussions. You know, what was Adam thinking? What was Eve thinking? And getting into their ways of thought. And at the same time, recognizing these are probably not historical people here. And then we can take that second avenue of interpretation where we say, when we understand that there's no historicity to these stories, then what might they be saying in a larger sense? And this ties into your comments about the priestly sacrifices or Ben's comment about the pastoral versus the agriculturalists. Perhaps another aspect to what's happening here is humanity, now that they have told the story, the fall of Adam and Eve, as the story of the start of moral agency. As humans, we have the capacity for deciding between right and wrong. And how we make those decisions has repercussions. At the same time, they're coming to understand, after having moral agency, that the world is not fair. Sometimes you make the right choice and something bad happens, or you make the wrong choice and you get away with it. And so they have to now think about what is the cause of that? If we can do something and get away with it or make the right choice and something bad happens and life is not fair and there is suffering, do we attribute that to God? The way God's portrayed in this passage without knowing is one of are one of these sacrificers perfunctory and one has a good heart without knowing the intentions behind it god in this passage is very fickle god is not behaving in the way we imagine god would do by showing this sort of favoritism by encouraging the sibling rivalry this isn't necessarily an accurate portrayal of god when we understand that we're not looking at a historical account but behind it there's an attempt to try to understand what is 
the origin of suffering in our world. We talked a little bit about theodicy last week, and there really wasn't a good explanation for theodicy. There's not really a good explanation here. But I think that these ancient writers are trying to come to terms with suffering. So what happens to Cain doesn't necessarily seem fair. Um, but then let's get into this passage that Chris pointed out to us. Um, a lot of this language is the inspiration for Steinbeck's East of Eden. Has anyone read that book? Incredible novel, recommended. Um, but the whole time they're dealing with this desire of whether or not, or this question of, of to what extent do we have control over the sin that is lurking at our door. So the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fell? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And so again, there is the point being made by God that these people do have moral agency. They have the capacity to do well with the implication that Cain has not done well. And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. It is desire is for you, but you must master it is the way this translation has it, or you should master, or you could master it. It could be translated in any of those ways. What do people make of that verse as we read it today? Yeah, Chris? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Great question. So Chris was noting that in the curse of Adam and Eve, the curse for Eve is that your desire will be for your husband. And using the same language of desire here, that there seems to be almost a sexuality to it. So her question was, is there a history of this being associated with this sort of the sin of, of sexuality or sin of female desire? Um, not that I've read. So that's a really great question. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read anything tying those two passages together, but it seems pretty obvious. So I, I, I'll do some research this week and see if I can find anything, but that's a really, really great note. Yeah. Malachi? I have an example of that. Yeah, go uh, ahead. In the 18th century, I just recently played in Virgil Leo. Okay. Um, the first homicide. Uh, uh, and all of Eve's arias are about like self-loathing and how awful she is and all of this. And when, uh, I mean, how have they pulled out a three hour work story book? From these lines, <laughs> the magic trick. But Cain's uh, arias are specifically about uh, how Eve's um, sin fell into him through wow through sex. Through that, so. Wow! 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 Okay. Um, so Malachi is an early music scholar and musician, and was saying there's an 18th century. You do mostly like what era? I do 17th century. 17th century. Okay. I'll, I'll go with that. Okay. All right. Um, um, so an 18th century oratorio that he recently played that was three hours about these texts and the oratorio was all about Eve's self-loathing and her sin and her desire. And then the oratorio goes into that sin falls into Cain, um, ostensibly through the act of sex. Um, and, and Chris, what has been written about a lot is the idea of original sin. And we talked about last week that the idea of original sin really isn't present in the text in the way that it will be developed much later in history. So the concept of original sin is a very late development. Um, but when they start talking about original sin, it is passed down through the act of sex such that when someone is born, they have been given that original sin from their parents by virtue of the intercourse their parents have had. And so... Yeah, there's a connection there. <laughs> and yet they were ordered to go forth and multiply. I don't know, it seems like God's almost taunting 
Seems as if God is taunting them. Yeah. I, I do think we need to observe that God's God's behavior is very strange. Yeah. And and just to um, comment on your first point, which is we, we could spend a whole, you know, college semester on sexuality and scripture and just the history of religion and sexuality and how sexuality has been um, sullied and made dirty using scriptural passages. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of movement in the church to, well, within progressive circles to try to um, unsully sexuality. But, <laughs> projection of a frustrated priest. Yeah, maybe. I've always interpreted his sexuality yeah. not accepted as if you had given a better offering, would not have been accepted? But that's not what comes before that. It's why are you angry and why are you coming to play? Why are you so upset that I favored one over the other? And I'm thinking, you know, as a teacher, I pray that one child, and I have this one child in my class who's always just Wow, wow, that's a, a really apt analogy. So if anyone didn't hear that, Shirley was saying in her class, she has a student who has to be number one. And if he's not the best at something, he becomes angry. And so tying verse seven into verse six, Cain is having to understand that there is acceptance to be found even in not being the best. And so God wants to know why Cain is angry, telling him, listen, if you do well, you, you will be accepted. And the student will be accepted by doing well, even if it's not number one or the best. And so there's part of mastering one's um, ego or id even. I, um, to me, like that line, like we should go, okay, sin is very real. And it's after the work because the desire is before you. And so um, I always think, man, that would be a powerful moment to work. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen people use this in terms of fighting addiction. Mm. And it speaks to a powerful metaphor. Like, moment there, um, be aware of it, kind of master. Um, Bob was saying this line seems so powerful and tying it into addiction, the idea that addiction can be lurking at the door, strong, powerful. You have to find ways to control it or master it, but never solve it. Yeah. Paul? It's the beginning and the end. It's why are you angry, but you must master it. It's from his anger that he goes out and kills his brother. Mm -hmm. And who I think is angry. So it's just so much cloud on his brother. And that is what I get from him. I don't know where everybody went off with the sexuality part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then sexuality, we associate that, but it's just not the same thing. Sexuality. That's all they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the connection was some of the language that's the sort of the desire and the mastering it. Um, but there are some, there, there's always multiple ways to read a passage. Um, and so I really like this. Okay, we've got the sexuality angle, but we've also got this anger angle, which we're getting into, which is, and you know, we've all experienced this, the power of anger to cloud our judgment, that if we don't take those moments to walk away and breathe and sleep on it and count to 10, we know how we react when we're in the throes of our anger. And that's what's happening here. Cain is reacting out of his anger. Uh, okay, one sacrifice was not accepted, but that's not the end of the line. Try again. 
without murdering your brother. I was just going to say, in reference to Chris's point, like, so if there's an echo of the language of Luke's verse, right, in verse 7 and verse 11, yes. uh, I, I think in Genesis 3, it's like the, uh, the ground is cursed, right? The, the Adam's first ground is mm-hmm. cursed, and, and now it's like you are cursed from the ground. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's echoing that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Kevin said we're echoing the curse of Adam in this as well. And so these, this is, God, oh, biblical scholars. No, just we are taking the curse of Eve. We're taking the curse of Adam, and it's been passed on to the next generation. The language of both of these curses ends up in this passage. Um, and it's interesting because the ground's already been cursed. Adam's already been cursed, but now both of those kind of ricochet, and there's this greater curse against Cain, this mark that he has to carry with him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People are going to be wrestling with this question throughout scripture. Is it true that if you do good, good things happen? If you do bad, bad things happen? It's the answer that Job's friends have for him. You're suffering. You must have sinned. There should be a reason for this. That book ends with the answer, like, actually, that's not the way it works. Um, God's judgment is beyond any, the, the answer from the book of Job, God's judgment is beyond anything that we can comprehend or understand. And so we just have to sit with fear and trembling and accept whatever happens. There's lots of answers to this question, but people are wrestling with it. Then we get Jesus who comes on the scene and says, well, actually the rain falls on the good and the bad. Uh, there's not a one-to-one corollary here. So yeah, we're wrestling with that question of suffering. Um, everyone has been saying some really great uh, comments. So... We're told that sin is lurking at its door. It's desires for you. You must master it. Um, Again, this is not an extraction from the mouth of God. These are human writers telling a story, but it is a really powerful, interesting line about this idea that humanity is tempted to commit evil, to commit atrocities. And we have the power to commit atrocities. And it is incumbent upon us in our moral decision making to master whatever desires come to us to commit those atrocities, despite how hard that might be. And Cain isn't able to do so. So Cain, go ahead, Kevin. Cain is enabled. Cain is enabled. Cain is enabled. That no. So Cain tells Abel, let's go out into the field. Cain has plans. He takes him out into the field, and there he rises up against his brother and kills him. Um, We have God acting in the same way after the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is eaten, where God is not presented as omniscient, or perhaps God is just, as parents might do, like, hey, did did you do something you were supposed to today? You know, they know the answer, trying to get the child to say it first. But God comes and says, oh, where's Abel? And then we get the famous line, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? I was just going to say that, which is not answered, which is something I have told my parents so many times. (laughs) Because there is no answer here. And I'm not my brother's keeper, right? How old the characters are? Yeah. 
<laughs> we don't know how old the characters are, but Donna's observing that it just seems so flippant to speak to God in this way. Yeah, I think it's really powerful throughout all of scripture. Um, we have so many examples of being able to dialogue with God in our anger, in our frustration, in our sadness. God's able to take the language we use as we work on ourselves. This is a better answer than Eve did it. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't blame God. He lies. The Lord says, what have you done? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. I think that's one of the most powerful images in all of the Bible. The blood is crying out. Despite Abel being dead, the act, the violence still speaks. It still has repercussions. There's something to answer for the violence that has been committed. It's almost as if the blood has poisoned the ground. So mm -hmm. I told Adam what happened with her, that she came, I guess, food, and now it's like blood has poisoned the ground. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So the curse of Adam, you know, the, the ground, you don't have to work the ground by the sweat of your brow while you get your food. But it's almost as if the blood has poisoned the ground and is the reason why you have to work even harder. Definitely. He's going to be on his own. Yeah. Yeah. So the point of this kind of mark that's put on Cain is that he's to be a wanderer. Um, and yet, because of that mark, people are supposed to know um, that they are that if they kill them, they will be punished as well. Um, just a quick aside. I mean, what have you noticed based on the language of this passage in terms of chronology? There's already a lot of people. We're told that uh, we're told that Cain and Abel are the first children of Adam and Eve, and yet Cain's worried other people are going to kill him. It's really hard to create a consistent narrative of you can't write about every single human that's born when you're putting this primeval history together to get a timeline to where there's actually other people. So there's always been a lot of people is what this passage is saying. Um, all right. So the blood goes into the ground. The blood is speaking. The blood is crying out. Um, Cain says his punishment is more than I can bear. And so the Lord says that basically this mark will protect him from further death. So putting it into modern language, if God is acting as judge in a sentencing hearing, what sentence is not passed? Capital punishment, death penalty. What'd you say? Not an eye for an eye. Yeah. Yeah. Which will be the development as the Hebrews put together their law. Lex talionis. They will say an eye for an eye in a lot of situations, unless you're a servant. Okay. Sevenfold vengeance. Yeah. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? A lot of seven, seven being, yeah, kind of this idea of completeness or totality. I've been listening to more recently talking about the gospel and have Jesus's genealogy as 14 generations. Seven. Yeah. 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 So Toby just noting that, which is uh, spot on, that numbers play an important role within Hebrew culture. And so we'll talk about that in a minute, actually, because we're going to get a genealogy to where the genealogies are not complete genealogies, but regarding the genealogies in the gospel, they're intended to be in groups of 14 to kind of speak to 
this is complete because it's a multiple of seven. Yeah, fulfills certain, exactly. Um, all right, so there's no capital punishment here. We've already seen this in the story of Adam and Eve when God tells them, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And then they don't die. That um, people come to me a lot and they say, I really don't know what to do with the God of the Old Testament. This God is vengeful and arbitrary and angry and punishing. And then you get the New Testament and God is loving and full of grace. And I identify with that, but I don't know what to do with the God of the Old Testament. Um, and I do my best in that you know, two minute response to try to defend the Hebrew scriptures as worthwhile of our time. Remembering here that we have an ancient people group doing their best to try to understand who God is. They're speaking to their experiences of who God is. And at the same time, they write themselves into the text. They write themselves into God. They are a tribal warfaring people in a time in the ancient Near East when everyone believed that the way you knew that you had the best God was if you won the battle. And if you lost the battle, it meant your God was not the best God. And you would even go and take the idols from the people that you defeated to say, my God has defeated the idols of your God. So they are reading God and their tribal culture into God and making him warfaring. Um, we talked when we did Isaiah about how a lot of the language used by for Baal, the thunder God, is used for Yahweh by the Israelites. So they're taking pieces of the other cultures to try to explain their God. And yet at the same time, we get glimpses of who we as humanity have come to understand God to be. We get these glimpses through the Hebrew scripture writers that actually this God isn't tribal. This God's the God over everything. And this God isn't warfaring. This God actually chooses peace. And we get that throughout the Hebrew scriptures. So we can't throw out the Hebrew scriptures. We have a lot of glimpses of who God is. This is a really important text. Um, this, while at the same time understanding its parameters. But with Adam and Eve and with Cain and Abel and both stories, we get an understanding that no matter the failure of humanity, there's always this grace from God. What we think will be the ultimate punishment doesn't happen. We're going to get that again with Noah and Abraham and Moses, all of these covenants. There's going to be human failure and divine grace. And that's going to be woven throughout Genesis. Any other comments about that passage? Yes, yeah, I was going to say about that passage, but um, we kind of coming back to the suggestion about the allegory about the conflict between um, pastoralists and agriculturalists. Because um, I think there's another theme that's introduced very early on, which is a lot of them. But one of them is the, the relationship uh, or the idea of uh, land ownership and land tenure. And there's just a relationship between humanity and the land, maybe particular groups of humanity, maybe particular lands. Um, but if you know, we consider that allegory, then this is probably more like a, a rewriting because um, it's, I think it's much more likely that it was the uh, pastoralists that killed the, the uh, agriculturalists because they were the ones that, you know, they drove their sheep through the land to eat the, but it was growing. So, you know, they were probably eating the grain or whatever mm -hmm. that uh, that the you know, people were growing. Um, and not the other way around. Really yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So Ben making observations that seems kind of the other way around historically that a pastoralist is taking the land from the agriculturalists. Um, but we are wrestling through this, um, throughout the Hebrew scriptures with what does it mean to have land ownership? Um, what does it mean for God to give people land? And that theological complication is at play today. Yeah. All right, let's read the last section of chapter four. 
Um, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. So Enoch was born Arad and Arad was the father of Mahujael and Mahujael was the father of Methu Methushael and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Um, Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah and the name of the other is Zilah. Adah bore Jabal and he was the ancestor of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all those who played the lyre and pipe. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he named Enosh. At that time, people began to invoke the name of the Lord. All right, we just have a few minutes here. Um, okay, so Cain goes into the land of Nod, and in the lore of um, Scripture kind of goes and is the father of some of the tribes of the Canaanites. Um, and so we're kind of getting a genealogy here of some of these Canaanite tribes. And it is very common in these ancient texts to come up with mythologies of, here's a, a people group that does something interesting and here's their great ancestor. And so we have that here where, um, there's not one people group that lives in tents and have livestock. Um, and yet there, this is just kind of explanatory. Here's this guy and everyone who came from him, you know, they live in tents and here's the ancestor, all the people who play the liar. How random is that? Um, surely other people were playing the liar and the pipe. Um, but they're just, these are called etiologies, kind of origin stories. Um, we have a sister who's named, we don't get any story. Um, but already more so than in any other ancient Near Eastern text, do we have some females worked into the text? Um, Lamech has this interesting passage where what Cain did um, is not the last murder. And so the temptation for murder, the temptation to, you know, we didn't. In our discussion, we didn't really take it. We have sibling rivalry, of course. Um, but brothers are also metaphors for just the relation between people. We didn't really dig into that. But we're kind of dealing with the fact of, all right, we have humanity. How do we live in harmony with each other amongst brothers and sisters? And it's hard. Um, and we're tempted to kill our brother. And so that sort of temptation continues and Lamech falls prey to the same temptations. All right, and then we have Seth. And Seth is supposed to be a replacement for Abel. And it's from Seth that the rest of humanity is born. And so in the genealogies we have, it always goes from Adam to Seth and then to the rest of humanity. But we already, as we know, have a lot of people on earth. And there's kind of a start to... This is the first time that people began to practice religion, is what this is saying, to invoke the name of the Lord, to say that there's a God. Um, and so it's kind of putting a time on the development of religion. That doesn't make sense when we think of Adam and Eve historically, because didn't Adam and Eve already know God? Um, but again, in this primeval history, they're kind of saying, okay, this is the advent of religious practice where we said there's something bigger than us, there's a God. You should have a problem with that language. <laughs> yeah, that's just deeply problematic. Um, that's to, to say that people would, I don't know, when a, when a child dies from a parent, that is heart wrenching. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, but nothing can replace that loss. 
No. Not even another child. No. I mean, it helps, but you still feel that loss. Absolutely. Wendy, just kind of noting the, the problematic language here, and we know that if you're ever talking with someone who's lost a child, don't ever say you'll have another or you have two other kids or anything like that. Pastoral Counseling 101, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that's kind of the, the issue that I find with this Bible is the translations and, and how they come out. And, and nowadays, you get to interpret it how you, how you want it, but that's what they did too, right? They interpret it. Like Pastor Sean Drew said, you know, this could be it, this could also be maybe this could be master goal. But with this passage, in general, it makes me think that Abel wasn't as a child, that Abel was, again, a brother of Cain's brother, or, or no, sorry, Cain wasn't as a child, that Abel was, and Cain was just a friend who looked around and did. And let's say, are saying that they could have washed our hands of Cain and aren't claiming. Yeah, a great observation, Daniel. Um, so Daniel was just saying, you know, makes him makes it seem as if maybe Cain wasn't Adam's son and just a friend and part of a different people group. That's certainly possible. Again, yeah, and and so God's punishment. So one explanation would be God's punishment is Cain has to wander and he leaves his family home, and so that's why they can't carry on their family name without another son. Um, but I like this idea of Cain just kind of representing a different people group altogether, um, because that that is what he ends up representing. Cain ends up representing the ancestors of the enemies of the people of Israel. The same thing will happen to Esau, who's the ancestor of the Edomites. The same thing will happen to Ishmael, who's the ancestor of the Ishmaelites. Um, and so we have all of these kind of second sons who the Israelites interpret as the ancestors of their enemies, which is interesting to be related to your enemy in that way. Again, how do we interact with our brother when we classify our brother as the enemy? So that was a great observation. And, and just to say what you said about the history of interpretation, yeah, um, there are complications in terms of how we um, translate scripture. And there are, we have to understand that scripture is translated in multiple ways throughout history. And so when we do our studies, we're trying to understand what how are we interpreting it and what is the history of interpretation um last comment was oh um and it's also practice we saw this when we studied isaiah you name a child a word a name that's related to a word and then you have a backstory for that word and so if you notice this note down here seth resembles the word for appointed and so she said, I'm naming him appointed because he's been appointed as my replacement child, which yeah, is probably All right. Any last comments on chapter four? Yeah, Rick. So in the beginning of 25, Adam and Eve was back again. And yeah. Talk about sex. We have to say. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so that um, is the way it has been translated. Um, in English translations for a long time. And because the word isn't uh, uh, the same word that's used as sex or intercourse. But so to, to know someone is biblical euphemism. Yeah. Uh, comment about marriage. Um, because uh, I think the only time Jesus refers to this creation story is when they ask him about divorce uh, for that trap. And he, instead of referencing you know, Deuteronomy where the word is okay, he talks about man takes his wife and he can love flesh. Um, but then uh, later on, that like, head takes two wives. So very, very early on, we have not, you know, monogamy or heterosexual marriage, uh, you know, exclusively, but also polygamy and uh, just other, you know, concepts of marriage. Yeah. 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 Um, easy, easy hold the poke in arguments where people are like, we've got to get back to traditional biblical family values. <laughs> traditional biblical family values are nothing um, like they think it is. So yeah, introduction of polygamy from the very beginning. 
Concubines, absolutely. It doesn't seem like whether it's sort of like threatening the domestic violence. So I don't understand why she was asleep. I built that. She just know that. Yeah, and and interestingly, um, God isn't the one saying that He's protecting them. He's basically like, right. it's almost as if it's a, a threat to the whole community. Like, listen up, I've killed this guy, but if any of you mess with me, then you think you you think it would be bad if you killed Cain. But imagine if you killed me. Yeah, very strange passage. Why does He tell his wives this? Um, very strange. All right, so um, next week we're going to have a different adult ed. Um, so anyone know the name Marilee Scaff? I know there are people in here who know that name. So she was a longtime activist within the Claremont community. And at 102 years old, she was fighting the water district when the city was getting a suing or getting sued about their water. Um, major activist. So she was president of the League of Women Voters for a long time. And each year she would put out a guide that was not intended to tell people how to vote, but just to help people better understand all of the propositions on the ballot so they could be more informed voters. So there's a pilgrim named Jean Boutillier, who's also an incredible activist, who's taking up her mantle and has put together kind of a guide on all of the propositions. And so he's going to be presenting about that next week. So I'm sure it will be super interesting. So that'll be in this room and then we'll pick up Bible study the week after with Genesis 5. Um, let me just close this with a quick word of prayer and we'll head to worship. God, as always, we thank you for this moment this morning to study scripture. Um, as always, we recognize that we leave with more questions than answers, um, but we at the same time um, are so appreciative of this spiritual journey that we can be on as a community where we can ask these questions and think through life and admit that we sometimes have the same anger issues as Cain or the same sibling rivalry or the same desire to deny our wrongdoing. And so we pray that we can use these passages both to receive your divine grace and to be um, distributors of that grace in this world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone.